You ready to do a deep dive around evaluating generative AI in large language models? Let me first start with why I wanted to do this. Every day I go and talk to different enterprises and I've seen hundreds of enterprises and I see how people are experimenting with large language models, trying out generative AI. And what I really see is lots of people doing science experiments. These are experiments, they're building things that just flatly aren't getting to production. And there's a number of reasons for that, but I think a big part of it is people have not properly evaluated all of what their work for getting them into production. And that's what I wanna tackle in this talk. So that way you can evaluate things, you can get your models into production by taking a look at both all the technical, the business and operational metrics. Now, of course, this is gonna be a long talk. We're largely gonna focus on the technical, but I think it's important for people to be cognizant and understand these other pieces because that's what it takes to get models into production and keeping them there. Now, we'll also um, go through a number of different technical ways to evaluate these large language models. I've categorized them like this. There's little bits of overlap between them. They're not all distinct. I'll give you some tools for how to kind of think about organizing all of these as well. And then at the end, I'll apply this to one of the most common use cases we have, the RAG use case, and just show you how we can think about evaluation in the context of a use case. So that way, you know how to apply it to kind of your particular use case as well. All right, are you with me? All right, let's jump into this. If this is gonna be a long talk. You have the YouTube video so you can skip around, repeat things as you want. I'm gonna probably talk a little quick because after all, you can always pause it. So the first piece is, let's talk about kind of where we are with these models. When we look at large language models, we can do things like summarization. I can ask it to uh, ask it a question, it gives me an answer. I can even work with kind of analyzing code this way and getting questions about code. There's so many different ways. And this is what makes it much harder to evaluate these models. It's not like the old days where we just had a simple confusion matrix for evaluating models. These models can output things in, in lots of different ways. And so, you know, we might, you know, you might talk to somebody and they say, go use the Hugging Face leaderboard. It's a great place to start. It's a very popular thing. And you go and, okay, let me go check out this leaderboard, right? This might be a good place for me to start to decide on a model. And you pull it up, but then you start looking at it and look what's happening. Like we see model after model after model after model. And if you keep scrolling down this, you'll see there's over 2000 models here. That's a lot of models to be able to go. It's just a little bit too overwhelming. Now, some of you with more academic mindset might say, hey, I'm gonna go check out that latest paper from Stanford, right? The holistic evaluation of language models takes time to analyze lots of different LLMs across different data sets, different metrics. And by the way, I say LLMs here, large language models. I say generative AI, I'm probably using them a little interchangeably here. Um, as well, so don't hold me too tightly on that. Now, so the Helm has lots of these models and data sets. They publish out the results so you can go and see and compare these. Now, if we go and look at just the paper itself, not even all the results for this, it's pretty voluminous. It's, it's 163 pages to help you kind of understand how to evaluate this. And literally, this is bigger than the Harry Potter book. Like, I mean, you're invested in kind of reading something like this. So at the end of the day, like most, most data scientists are overwhelmed when they go in, try to figure out like, how should I get started and how should I evaluate my large language models? And let me tell you, it's, it's, it gets a little worse because if you actually dig into something like Helm, you'll see they've picked a couple of data sets for different scenarios. But if you change those data sets a little bit, that can change the winners and the scoring inside those categories. So it's not very reliable. I mean, a great example of this is when we look at the OpenAI models, we see that the newer model is ranked behind the older model. And look, I make fun of OpenAI. I have lots of fun TikToks that you know make fun of them. They're the leader, but they're also very good in engineering. And I don't really think that they would put out and release a model that was worse than a previous model. So it makes me kind of you know, double take and think about, you know, exactly how useful these benchmarks if they're not able to capture the new release of a model that we know is likely to be better. Um, besides this, if we go over and look at the Hugging Face leaderboard, there's a whole other set of issues. That leaderboard's based off four data sets. 
And if we look carefully at kind of what the differences are between the top models, we'll see it's largely based on this one data set called Truthful QA. I mean, and what I would ask you is, is like, you know, if you're choosing a large language model, is how does does on Truthful QA really the, the differentiating factor for you? How does that relate to kind of the use cases that you're working on like that? And so, you know, for all of this, it makes me ask, you know, are these leaderboards really useful for us? And um, Aperna over at um, Ariz wrote a great article on this talking about how a lot of the ways we think about evaluation are really where we want to compare against many language models and we're trying to figure out which is the best language model. And for most of academia, that's what they want to do. For you know all those people that are constantly putting out new language models and want to compare how they're doing against others, that's the game they're playing. They're trying to show how their model ranks compared to the hundreds, tens of thousands of other models. But for most of us, if you're working on projects, that's not where you want. You really often have one model that you've selected and you're trying to fully optimize that model for your use case. And this is where a lot of the work that's out there falls down and isn't as useful. And we're gonna explore that um, as we keep going through this. And this is where it can be feel a little bit lost here. And so when I'm lost, when I'm coding, when I'm lost, I like to go back to fundamentals. And so what I wanna do is spend a few minutes thinking about the fundamentals here, and that's gonna help us think through the best way to think about evaluation with large language models. So let's start with a simple churn problem, right? This is the classic 101 data science problem. Imagine there's a baseline churn model. Your boss asks you, hey, can you build a model to improve that churn model, right? Like how would you think about evaluation in that case? You know, as a data scientist, you know, you might go and build something like this and calculate out a confusion matrix. You have your AUC, your precision recall, and go bring that to your boss and be like, look, hey, you know, hey boss, look what I've been able to build. I've been able to build a better model. And my guess is some of you think that this is a really good way to evaluate a model, but it's missing something. So what this is, is this is often what I would call a, how a junior sci data scientist would evaluate a problem. Let me show you this, how we can evaluate the same problem in a more, in a more sophisticated way, more in line with the business. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use that same types of metrics, but we're gonna put dollar amounts in. We're gonna put dollar amounts in for when we get something correct and dollar amounts for when we miss. And then based on that, we're able to compare different models, be able to compare to our baseline and see what is the profit, what is the revenue we could generate by using a particular model. And this gives us a much more kind of deeper understanding of the model that's in line with the business's understanding. And this is often what I would say, how a senior data scientist, somebody who's been in the field that knows you have to sell the model to the business, this is how they would think about it. Now there's still one other th way to think about this. Now, you can think about this in terms of a more systems approach where you, someone would say, you know, within three weeks, I, we could all build a model that reaches 80% accuracy. And I know based off past history and you know what this data set looks like, what the models looks like, that if we spent you know five more weeks, eight weeks total, we could hit 83% accuracy. But at the same time, we understand these customers are changing, that this is a moving problem, and that you know they, they turn over every six months. And so, you know, based on all these circumstances, this is how somebody that's a data science leader starts to evaluate the total cost of ownership of the modeling process and thinks about it from a very big picture. So that's a perspective that I want you to bring and think about as well when you're working through these problems. Now, when we go to generative AI, again, there's many different ways to evaluate these models. But one thing is, is uh, many, oh, but we're gonna still use the same principles. I'm jumping ahead of myself. We're gonna still use the same principles. We're gonna focus on the technical here as well. Oh, one thing I wanna say is, is people ask, you know, when do we use evaluation? Evaluation comes through the entire machine learning life cycle. You're gonna use it at the beginning of a project to help think about, you know, should we go on this project? Does it make sense to invest in the project? 
Obviously, you're going to use it at training time of the model. Later, once you've got that model in production, the, the sister of Evaluate is monitoring. You have to keep eyes on that model as all. Well. So this is how I made this nice little picture to always think about kind of the role of evaluation is you're going to be thinking about it, you know, looking in the past for what we've done before, in the present for when you're training models, and then in the future when we're going to be worried about things like monitoring. So all those times, evaluation's a big part of it. I also want to point out that if you take the time to build a good evaluation suite, you can end up having your improving your modeling pastor. It'll be faster, it'll be better, it'll be cheaper. I'll give you one anecdote. Recently, and this is as of um, November um, when I'm making this video, Hugging Faces team released the Zephyr model. It was based on a data set that came out on Monday, and by Thursday, they had built out the first initial version of the model and released it out to the public. Amazing, right? Just three or four days, built a model that was kind of top of the leaderboards. But how did they do that? Well, the reason they were able to do that is because they had spent the previous four months building out their pipelines, building out their evaluation system, building all those tooling in place so they were able to then act quickly. And this is often hidden, and we forget about this when we work with models. When I work with enterprise teams, I can see the teams that have invested in data pipelines, invested in evaluation, invested in monitoring, because they're able to build things much quicker and faster. And so often the algorithms get a lot of, you know, a lot of attention, the people doing that, but you always want to build these pipelines in. You want to think about those fundamentals and evaluation is a key point here in helping you quickly iterate through that. And you want to keep that in mind as you go through this. So, when you're working with um, LM, sometimes you're, what you're doing is you're, 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 your problem is really mirroring a traditional task. So in this case, for example, I'm using an LM, but it's really a sentiment task. Well, in that case, if it's a sentiment task, go ahead and use the traditional metrics that you can use, your traditional baseline models. Now, be a little careful with the data sets and just know that some of the large language models might have been trained on those same data sets that, um, that you're using to evaluate it. So, you know, th there could be some leakage that they might do a little bit better than you might expect it to. But th it's a great way to kind of work with traditional models like that. Another wrinkle that I've seen is if you have some type of automated evaluation suite already using those classic approaches, sometimes the LMs actually might seem to do worse but if you actually take the time to look at them, they actually do much better. And that's because these new generation of large language models have a great understanding of language. It's very fluid, very rich understanding that some previous ways that we've kind of analyzed language didn't pick up. And then so this one paper, for example, when they went back and looked at it and actually had humans evaluate the results of the sentiment, the models did markedly improvement over their previous automated piece here. You know, this is another piece that we have to think about. These models are so good that often when we're setting up human baselines, these models can break it. So summarization is an easy example here where even back with GPT-3, the models were able to be on par with humans, with kind of human writers. And the latest research I've seen, so this came out a couple of weeks ago, looking at medical reports where the folks, the GPT-4 models were able to write medical reports that humans liked much better than the human ones liked. So just be aware that, you know, when you're setting up these baselines, when you're working with these models, often the models can kind of break the baselines as well. All right, so now it's time for the big list here. These are all the different methods I want to walk through. Now, there's a certain amount of blurring, a certain amount of overlap. When you go to use these in practice, it's not like you just pick one and that's it. Often you'll use two or three together like that. Now, one way to kind of think about it and organizing this, because I had that list and I was like, you know, how could I better think about this? Is I thought about this in two dimensions. One is cost. Another one was kind of the flexibility of the approach. And I, I arbitrarily gave it numbers here just to kind of space things out. But you can see here, there's a difference between something like an automated benchmark approach, which is kind of lower on the cost, versus something like human evaluation or red teaming, which is has a higher cost involved. Similarly, there's a kind of a flexibility, and we'll talk about this where we're gonna start when we go through this with 
the least flexible approaches like exact matching, and we'll work our way up to the more flexible things like human evaluation and red teaming. So hopefully this will help us kind of organize this as well. Again, this is like one of the earliest first times I'm putting together a video like this. I imagine six months from now, this will change dramatically um, like that. So let's jump into um, exact matching. Now that's down here at the bottom here where it's very least flexible, kind of a little bit on the kind of the cheaper side of the cost approach. Now, exact matching might seem like a nice simple piece for you where we're gonna ask the model to output something like a yes, no, A, B, C, D, something where we can see that it exactly matches a ground truth. So that there's already a reference ground truth, right? Some human, some something else has labeled this. We'll, we'll talk about synthetic data sets later, but something has labeled this and we're just gonna match the two together. Now, for most of you, you should be thinking like, this is easy, right? Like matching, like we, we write simple kind of Python logic functions like this. Like how hard could evaluation be if all we have to do is like, see if two things are the exact same? Let me tell you, brother, <laughs> we've got some issues here. We're gonna talk about this. We're gonna walk through this all the way through the workflow, kind of from talking about it from inputs, the model to the outputs here. And along the way, I'm gonna kind of share some stories to kind of give this a little bit of a richer feeling here. So let's start with kind of looking at the inputs of this. Now, when we, a good, a good example of what's happening with the input is um, a little bit of the story on MMLU leaderboards. So, and I think this was probably about six months ago, um, Tom Wolf, you know, one of the co-founders at Hugging Face, um, sent out, a, a, you know, a tweet brand new LLM topping the leaderboard, right? Everybody loves to have, you know, a new model kind of beating on top of the leaderboard. And you can see, you can take a look at it, right? Like hundreds of thousands of people kind of saw this tweet and in it talks about, you know, how good this model is doing. Now, of, the, of these hundred thousand, there's always a few people that actually kind of dig into this. And somebody looked at it and said, wait a minute, where did the numbers here for come in? Because when I look at the paper, the numbers are a little bit different than what you're saying you beat over there. Hmm. Now, the numbers here that there was a sticking point was, was often what's known as MMLU. MMLU is a widely used metric when we're talking about large language models. It kind of gets at the knowledge of, of, of these models. It has a number of different tasks like history, computer science, math. You can see the questions here, you know, like, you know, can you solve this physics problem? And this is widely used to kind of help us figure out like how much, how smart a model is. Now, this is also when I ask you again, like how relevant is this to your enterprise task? But let's leave it, let leave that aside and kind of let's dive into kind of why was it, you know, why were these scores different? Well, some folks on the Hugging Face team jumped in and they noticed that there's a couple of different ways, different ways people are evaluating these models. And one part is, the prompts that they were using were a little bit different. And so if you look here on kind of the left side, you'll see each of these three things. And if you look carefully, you'll see some subtle differences. And if you want to go ahead and pause it, take a look and see like, can you figure out what are all the differences in prompts here between them? And if you kind of stare at it and compare them, you know, long enough, you'll be able to see some differences like the helm has an extra space, right? The Luther one has no topic line about foreign policy. You know, there's a question prefix, choices. So you can see that there's a little bit of change. And I know most of you are probably saying like, come on, like these language models, right? They, I can phrase things in two different ways and it understands, like why would it matter exactly how, how it would say this? Well, our folks, our friends over at Anthropic also kind of noticed this and they also wrote up their own, um, their own evaluation of this. And, you know, they shared that when they were doing this and looking at this, they noticed that just even simply changing things from parentheses A to one parentheses, like that had a change or just the style of the parentheses itself can affect things. We're adding an extra space and all of these, and I should have paused it to kind of point out the MMLU scores earlier, but they point out this could lead to a 5%, which you trust me or go back and look like 5% is a pretty big deal on the MMLU evaluation. And so, I want you to take two points away from this, not only the sensitivity to how the prompts are, 
but you should also be a little bit skeptical when you look at these benchmarks that people see because you can see how much just in the style of these prompts you can control how well a model does that it's very easy if somebody takes more time to kind of massage this to maybe kind of get a little bit better of a score versus somebody that did this quickly so i always take all these reported scores with the caveats like that until you kind of test them out on the things that matter to you but this is another kind of data point along that line all right so there we go we know the the, the prompts there have a difference i have one other little story i want to share about the prompts. I think this is fascinating. And this is um, another model, right? The Falcon model came to the, to the top of the leaderboard and immediately somebody was like, wait a minute, this Falcon model looks cool. Like it's great, it's open, but why is it so keen on Abu Dhabi? And why won't it talk about human rights abuses? Like what's it hiding? Like you can see here, it, it's, you know, it hypes up Abu Dhabi as a technical city. And another one says, you know, hey, I, how come it won't tell me about human rights? And so right, there was a vibe from some people, like, is this a Middle Eastern model and is it biased like that? Well, some of the folks on the Hugging Face team dove in and kind of let me show you kind of um, what we figured out was going on like that. So I'm going to play this and give me a second. I'm going to blow this up. We'll work through this as best we can. So here's an example of the demo. Let's go in and let's see. There's the overall demo. We'll start to do add some queries in there. So, right, that's recommend me a technological city and, ugh, right, uh-oh, Abu Dhabi, right? Like the Middle East city is right at the top. Like, come on, there's lots of cities. Why is that? Although when I repeated it, you'll see it didn't pop up that time, right? Then we'll talk about non-deterministic in, um, in a little bit like that. And so let's keep going here. Um, I'm gonna ask about human rights abuses and it won't say anything about the Middle East, right? It, right? It's sensitive times because of that. Maybe this model has been built so it doesn't tell us about um, any of those types of things. I'm gonna skip forward here. So what's going on? Well, if you dig into the model, you go down to these kind of parameters and instructions, you'll see something interesting here. And let me pause it. You'll see in the instructions here, it points out that the Falcon was built in Abu Dhabi. So as an experiment, we went and we changed that Abu Dhabi to another city to see what would happen. So let's change that to Mexico. Let's scroll up. And now we're gonna kind of ask it some questions here. So when we ask it about human rights abuses in Mexico, now we see, oh, look, it's not telling us about human rights abuses in Mexico. It's the model itself isn't talking about human rights abuses. That's what it is. It's been kind of instruction tuned in that way as well. Um, let's, let's see if the, I don't can't remember. And if I ask about technologically advanced city, we lose Abu Dhabi kind of there um, when it's no longer in the prompt here. This is a reminder to think about these system prompts when we're working with these models. Um, I know in the case of, for example, the Llama model, when the Llama model was originally released, the Llama 2 model, it included a system prompt around safety. Now, after about two months or so, the meta team decided that, you know, the, the RLHF layer, the layers that they had put on there were good enough to prevent any safety violations and advise people to remove that. And so some people that didn't realize that that prompt had been removed were comparing their queries before and after and got confused because there was a slight change. And again, it was due to that system prompt. Um, if you want to kind of play around with and get an idea of the system prompt um, like that, I've put on a hands-on exercise here where you can go and do that. This is probably for people who are a little bit newer to LLMs and you can kind of make this into right a little kind of robot that has a little bit of an attitude um, like that. But for now, I'm going to jump on instead of spending time on this. So we talked about kind of some of the variations on the input inputs that can affect these models, right? The exact matching. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about kind of what can go wrong. What are the variability when it comes to the models itself? Now the model itself, of course, right? We know models come in different sizes and variants of this. This is a great paper pointing out the difference in OpenAI's models, so GPT-4 and GPT-3.5. And, and this is asking about political questions. It's asking, looking at kind of the bias in models, if folks are interested in that. 
And you'll see, even though these two models come from the same group, right? Same training, whatever their training data, but the same group, but both come from OpenAI, they give very different outputs, you know, when asked the same questions like that. And this is some of the variability we can get when we even go between different models of the same size. The other thing I want you to kind of understand also is, especially if you're coming from like working with classical models like logistic regression, where you had deterministic um, inference, where when you work with the model risk teams, you were able to reproduce everything right down to like six significant digits. It gets a little bit more difficult with LMs. For most LM use cases, what's happening is when we're working with GPUs, there's going to be a tiny bit of non-determinic inference. Even when you set the temperature hyperparameter setting down, there's other settings that can, of course, go far away from non-deterministic inference. But this is something to be aware of when you're thinking about reproducing all of your um, experiments like that. Another piece is for those models that you don't control and own yourself. So things like GPT three and a half and four that are commercial API where the vendor can change the model. We've seen cases where these models have changed over time as well. So that's another thing that even though you have that exact um, input and output, it can change that as well. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, right, there's common hyperparameters that we use all the time that can influence predictions as well. So you see, there's a ton of stuff here that even for the simplest problems that we have to think about. Um, and the last piece is even evaluating outputs, there can be a little bit of variation. And a way to think about this is take a multiple choice problem. I could constrain the inputs kind of just like this sheet that you can only constrain it to A, B, C, D, or E. That's it. Those are the only five inputs. That's one way of kind of tackling this problem. But we know these models like to chat. So maybe what we're going to say is let it chat, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the first letter, and that's the answer I'm going to take. And you see, it works in some cases, but not in others. Some of you might be like to think about a little world a little bit larger, maybe a little bit holistically, and say, you know what, I'm going to evaluate the entire answer like that. All of these are perfectly legitimate. One of the interesting things when they dug into that kind of dip, different or the discrepancy in the MMLU is they saw three different ways that these models were used to evaluate um, the outputs. So again, like just be cognizant of all these kinds of differences and you have to carefully define exactly what you're gonna do for your particular use case as well. Because these differences have impacts. They can affect the scores and which models are ranked and which you know use cases and which hyperparameters you move into, um, into public. This isn't just these kind of few models, <laughs> this is widespread. So the local llama folks um, have a great subreddit. One of the one of the people kind of just shared um, a spreadsheet of the results of lots of different models. And you can see here, they're just asking something very simple, sentiment. But these models, they like to talk in different ways, right? Some of them are like, just go on and on, long, long sentence. Some of them give you a nice short answer like that. But this is just part of kind of the world that we live in with these generative models um, like that. Now, there's ways we're building. People are starting to tame them. I think one of the very cool things is OpenAI introduced function calling that helps you get that a nice kind of structured JSON output, um, which is one key. The Guardrails AI project by Microsoft is another one, and we'll talk a little bit more about later, that has some output validation. A lot of other vendors in this. I just highlight some of the vendors here. Don't think this is a final list um, like this. But again, just emphasizing all the things that can go wrong. Often, you're going to think about doing lots of iterations here to be able to kind of deal with all these little things that can be slightly different from um, case to case when you're working with this. So let's jump in next. We're going to Keep going, we're gonna to touch on similarity approach. Now this is in the same ballpark here as the exact matching. You'll see here, it's a little bit more flexible than the others. Now, so to understand the similarity approach, let me start with another story. So this, is, this happened about 20 years ago. IBM was working on language translation. So what I want you to understand is the things on the left side, reference one, reference two, reference three, those were translations made by humans from Chinese to English. Those are our gold standard. Those are the ones that are known. Now, over on the, the right side, we'll see there's two kind of answers that came out of the computer. 
What I want you to do is take a look at both of them and see which one do you think is a better answer and why. And so this is, I, I, I ask this all the time when I kind of do this live to kind of force people to take a look at this and try to come up with the intuition for why you think one of the answers is better. Now, when people think about this a little bit, usually most people will pick reference one and you'll see that there's a lot of kind of sentences and phrases that overlap into reference one or, or in candidate one with the ones in reference one, two, and three like that. And so this is usually the one that people kind of choose as that. And what, what you start seeing is, is that you see that that idea of repeated phrases matters a lot. And this is, the, this is a paper IBM created 20 years ago. And from this, they created a metric called the blue metric, which essentially takes a look and sees how much of that generated text that's been created is in the reference text. And this is kind of a similarity metric where the more you have, the higher the score you have, and it's known as blue, and it's widely used in kind of NLP for this kind of um, matching like that. I, give, I have the example there on the right. Now, this is just one. There's many other similarity methods that are out there um, that you can use um, for this. They vary. There's lots of you know issues with each, but I just want to kind of give you the heads that it's great to use similarity approaches. They're fast and easy to calculate. Often, though, they don't consider the meaning or sentence structure. They're just looking for those common um, pieces like that. It can be affected by tokenization. There's a bias toward shorter text. And this is another one I want to point out is a lot of the traditional academic benchmarks are often based on shorter text. And often the way we like to use these large language models for enterprise use cases is often longer answers. So this is one that you have to kind of be wary of some of these um, these these similarity metrics and these um, benchmarks out there that might be using a lot of shorter text as well. So my, here's another paper, lots of similarity metrics out there um, like that. Now, one area where the similarity metrics fall down is let's say we have a problem where we're trying to build and get kind of a code answer like return, return a list with elements incremented by one. There's a lot of different answers. And if we look at those answers, we'll see that this kind of metric really doesn't work for code. And this is where I wanna move next to functional correctness. And I think functional correctness has a lot of power and a lot of value for generative AI. I kind of put this over here where it's a bit more flexible. It does have a little bit higher cost, but um, I, I see it as, as, as a lot of value for that. Now, the way to think about functional correctness, it comes out of this world where when we're working with evaluating code, there's so many different solutions that are out there. And if we just you know, used a traditional similarity blue score metric, it wouldn't do that well at being able to capture that. And so this is where people were forced to come up with a new idea for how to evaluate code. And what they came up with was this idea of essentially a unit test, and this is what I'm calling functional correctness, where instead of looking at the similarity, what we're gonna do is we're gonna test the code. We're gonna have several known examples, and we're gonna see, do, do those examples pass, right? One, two, you know, in this case, there's you know three examples like that. And this is something I want you to think about. In here, you'll see it's kind of similar examples where they, they just put the number at different ways. A lot of times in generative AI, we're gonna have lots of varied outputs where we're not gonna be able to have one measure for them. And this approach of breaking down the problem and either having some examples or breaking it into modular pieces and evaluating each of those differently is something that we're gonna to have to use a lot. So it's important to kind of get your head around the idea and the value of this approach here. And we see this, this is widely used with kind of code-based um, models like that. And I think it's important to kind of work through and think about how you would do this. So imagine you had to build a system to draft emails, right? You were gonna draft potential emails to um, your, your, your clients. You know, like it's not easy to say is that email properly done or not. You might think about like, could you add some functional text that help you understand was that email correct to, correctly constructed? And you might say, you know, was that email concise? I, mean, I don't want two-page emails. I want something that's much shorter. 
I want to verify that before I send that email to my client, that there's an action in there. There's something for them to do um, in there. I want to make sure that it's a polite email. Right? Each of these are different things that we could test or we could evaluate within a model. And so if we take a look, I'm not going to switch to the code. It, it's, it's too much of a break to do that. But if you look at the notebook here, and I've got the GitHub repo has all the notebooks um, that I'm talking about and a copy of the slides. You can take a look and run through the notebook. But what you'll see in the notebook example is taking this exact use case around emails, breaking that up into properties so then we can evaluate each of those themselves. Later, I'm going to talk about model-based evaluation using models. But for now, I just want you to think about breaking the problem into separate parts. Whether it's a human, whether it's a model that evaluates it, doesn't matter um, like that. So we're, let's go on to evaluation benchmarks. Evaluation benchmarks sits over here where it's a little bit less flexible, but a little bit cheaper. Evaluation benchmarks are widely used. And let me tell you the story about the glue benchmark to kind of why, why we're in this world of benchmarks um, like this. So the glue benchmark was created in 2018. And I remember as a data scientist, 2017, 2018, much of what we do and what most people did with models is you would get a model, to get a model, you would train it on some specific data of that domain, and then you would evaluate it on very similar data from that domain. And that was the common way we kind of built models. And those models really were only good for that task in the domain. When Glue was built, it was to push against that. And it was to say, you know, what we want is we don't want a model that's only good for one task. We want a model that can do lots of different types of NLP tasks. But we also want to have a model that really understands language and, and, and really gets it. And we don't have to train it every time. Like the model should have a good understanding of that. Maybe we give it a little bit of data, but really we want that model to do that. And that's what, that was the challenge with the Glue benchmark. And they even had a private data set to separately evaluate these models. Now, the th great thing the Glue benchmark did was they gave a nice defined problem like this with a benchmark that was easy for people to use and see if they were able to match it. There's a lesson here for all of us when we're working inside enterprises, when we give people benchmarks that are well-defined, easy to use, we can drive progress in that direction. The Glue was remarkably successful. I think they, I think Glue 2 came out a year later like that. And what we've seen now is a lot of these multitask benchmarks um, because of the success of this, because it's kind of helped advanced science like that. So you have things like Hella Swag for natural language. One of my favorites, Big Bench, because the Big Bench, the subset here, the original Big Bench has like 200 tasks. This is like 23 tasks, but they have the average and the max human. And so this is an interesting one for me where you can see lots of models, for example, do as well as the average human on these tests, right? That, for those of you who want to think about the implications of models and where we are with these models, right? Like having benchmarks that, that kind of show you how we are against humans is interesting like that. It's also one that's actually quite hard to kind of get your model working with as well. But this is just the beginning of benchmarks. I ran across and I spent some time like just looking at a couple of the other benchmarks. These are all the benchmarks I could find in like literally just like, you know, 15 or 20 minutes of searching around. There's an overwhelming number of benchmarks that people are using with large language models like that. Because again, they have value, but just remember each of these benchmarks is, is capturing something differently. And for us, when we're using these models, we're often using them for lots of different types of tasks. So having a benchmark that you know aggregates across many tasks gives us a quick way to see you know, which models are gonna be um, useful. Now, the benchmarks themselves will use many of the methods we've already talked about. They might have, use exact, <coughs> similarity or functional methods, any of these, they might combine that. That's okay. The idea of a benchmark is just having ways to evaluate these models um, like that. Now, as soon as you have a target, as soon as you have something, you'll see gaming, right? There's everybody wants to be at the top of the leaderboards. And so one of the things we've seen is people that have that are, you know, people papers that look like they're trying to kind of cheat a little bit and get to it. And the cheating sometimes might even not be intentional. Um, 
Nathan, for example, has recently kind of wrote that some issues with the alpaca eval leaderboard where he noticed that the models that had longer, the, the longer outputs were winning a little bit higher. And so it could be some type of bias like that that we're not even aware of that can affect these um, benchmarks. But it's just something to be aware of kind of when you use these benchmarks. Now, there's many tools if you have your own model you want to use your benchmark. The John Snow Labs has put out LangTest and you can click on the link. You'll see they have about 50 different notebooks and tutorials and tests that you can use, including the MMLU that you can use and quickly kind of evaluate different models. And then there's also kind of the, the, the OG kind of evaluation, the Luther evaluation harness, which supports over 200 tasks. This is the most widely used one to do that. Even a below average data scientist like me was able to get this running. There's, I put the code snippet for kind of what I did um, to get it running on a sentiment data set. You can see it's it's pretty simple. I just tell the model, you know, few shot, how many tasks. Um, I have a CoLab notebook where you can run this yourself if you want to kind of just try it out. But it's an easy, easy to use harness that you can kind of get um, use with your own models as well. But what I want to leave you with is, you know, as we talk about this, Open, oh, open AI also has an, a framework as well for kind of thinking about evals as well. But one thing I want to leave you with was when we're talking about these benchmarking test suites is, yes, we can evaluate a lot of tasks. They're cheap and wide. But just remember, they're limited to these like easily measured things. Often, one thing you see is like a lot of the benchmark tests I showed earlier were multiple choice tests, right? Often again, like the outputs we want are free form. So just know that, you know, that there's some limitations of that. They can also, they can also cheat again with, leak, with um, leakage. It's not easy sometimes wiring these up. But I still think there's, oh, I still haven't got to that page. All right, there's again, many different leaderboards. The Hugging Face has one. The folks over at Databricks and Mosaic ha have their own kind of leaderboard. Helm has their leaderboard. I'm finally getting to the point that I really want to say, I think it's useful for you to build your own leaderboards. I think it's useful if you're an organization that has multiple use cases with large language models, has specific things, consider building your own internal leaderboard. And that way you can be able to, as new models, because we're living in a day and age where there's literally models every week, you know, that seem to be better than the, the previous ones that having some type of easy way for your team to be able to evaluate a couple of these models, you know, in a month um, it, it is very useful as well as when you're own, building own, your own models internally and doing it. If you're like, hey, how am I going to build something like this? Here's a couple of great examples for you. Legal Bench is an example of a domain specific benchmark. So you can see how they built their agents bench is an example of a, a benchmark that was built for specific functionality. Um, the OWL one, I like it because it's a very mundane topic, IT operations, right? This paper wouldn't get any love anywhere else, but I think it's great because they spent the time talking about exactly how they built their training sets, how they built their um, evaluation data sets as well. So here's an example of kind of the, the evaluation leaderboards I may build for my own customers where you can see we have the model at the top and I have even kind of a different type of data set here um, that's measured. Now, that OWL use case, I like it because they spent some time talking about the final evaluation data set they had. You know, they put together several hundred question answer pair, pairs. They had a multiple choice part with a thousand questions. All of these questions, they had their own folks internally review, to at least two people review each of these. So they, that way it covers all the different subject areas that it was truthful like that. But it reminds you that there is a cost that's associated with building these evaluation data sets. And it's something that you have to take into consideration when doing this. Now, we do have the ability to use synthetic tools to help speed this up, but that's not gonna, that's not gonna help in every case, but it's something to be aware of when you're planning out your use cases um, like that. It's right in our 10 minute demo world, you don't see that. Um, the last piece I wanna point out is one thing to always keep in mind with benchmarks is we're aggregating many different signals. And what can happen is, is some of the signals we care most about, we might kind of lose out or might be overshadowed by, you know, things that are more powerful that we don't care about. So 
think about that when you're looking at these benchmarks because there might be certain tasks that you care more about the performance on that than others um, like that. Just don't blindly average them without kind of taking a look at a little deeper look at this. Let's move to human evaluation. This is a kind of a classic one that we should all somewhat be familiar with. It's essentially the kind of the gold standard for kind of doing data science. And it's part of any real evaluation process. We'll often have human evaluation as part of it just because humans can capture a lot of nuance. They can capture a lot of things that exceptional um, considerations like that. I should also point out, we know how to work with humans and how to use them as annotators. For example, we know that we have to have multiple humans annotating something because often there could be disagreement between humans. And, you know, if the humans only can agree 80% on something is, is you know, the, the right answer, you can't expect your models to get 90%. So, you know, these are things we have to consider kind of during the development process. There's methods for working with annotations where we want to give guidelines. We want to make sure everybody's annotating in the same way. We, we do this. We establish this with training. We have quality checks through there. All of this is done. All of this has been kind of well-studied stuff that folks out there should be aware of that, you know, don't try to reinvent it. Now, when we're working with LMs, we have noticed some problems where humans, for example, were more likely to defer to LM outputs that are very assertive, right? If the LM is really assertive that this is the facts, humans might be like, okay, um, with that. Similarly, if the LM is a little bit too pleasing, a little bit too much, you know, kisses the butt too much of the humans, in that same way, the humans might be biased towards that. So things to consider kind of when human using humans with um, LMs like that. Now, I think one thing to keep in mind is humans, they're great for a wide variety of outputs and the gold standards, but they can be expensive, especially if it's right, you have to move beyond the data science team, you have to go track down kind of doctors or IT workers or some specialists and getting their time to do that. Humans also have a large variation. So not only between kind of the layperson and the doctor kind of variation, but depending on what time of day you do it, right? Like, how I'm feeling in the morning versus after lunch, in the evening. Like humans have incredibly varied like that. And that can affect kind of the annotations for when people are filling this out. Um, again, we've talked about how they're biased, low factuality. They can be manipulated by different prompts as well. It's very easy to collect human data. Um, I gave the example in, in, the, um, in the GitHub repo. You can go check out this space by Argilla. They're open source, so I have a soft spot for the open source. But they show you here kind of how to easily set up um, set up human annotation for whether we want to rank responses, whether we want to rate them on a scale of one to five. Lots of flexibility to kind of get the human feedback. But if you're new to this, what I want to point out is, is you know, there's Argilla, there's other tools that are out there. Spend a day or two, you'll find those annotation tools, set them up. They're going to pay off in the long run when you build out those tools for including your domain experts and getting that feedback in there. It's not too hard to do it at all. One trend we're also getting is, is as we work more and more with LMs, people are starting to develop guidelines for working with humans. So this is one on summarization where, you know, the results of this paper were like, hey, after we spent this time doing summarization with humans, here's some learnings that we learned about for future people doing that. So I expect we'll get more of these as we get more studies working with that. All right, let's next talk about human comparison, kind of the arena approach. And this is related to human evaluation, but separate enough that I wanted to make it its own category. And you can see here, um, it's not as it's not as it's a little less flexible and a little kind of cheaper um, as well. So what is this approach and kind of what am I talking about? Well, to understand it, you have to look at me. And if you look at me, you might be like, that guy, that guy's never been single, right? Like, but no, I have been single. And let me tell you about that. About 10 years ago, I was doing online dating. And online dating about 10 years ago, the way it worked is that people would fill out these long forms for kind of how you were doing your dating. And the idea was if we fill out, you know, lots of detailed information, 
we can then analyze that and figure out, you know, who are good matches for each other, who are good life partners based on kind of having lots of similarities like that. And that was like, you know, how that human evaluation data was collected then. As we've advanced in dating, we've made a number of changes. And what we figured out is, you know, that approach really doesn't compare to the simple thumbs down, thumbs up that we get with swiping. And this is the modern way to collect this preference data. And it works really well. And it's widely used nowadays when we're working with humans because it's often much easier to get that type of thumbs up, thumbs down data than have people write a long description about things. And you'll see, for example, the folks over at Open, OpenAI use this when they're trying to get feedback from customers. We've had other folks set up spaces, getting feedback, setting up arenas where we can compare two different models against each other and ask humans, which do you prefer? And then we can even take all of that, rank the models, do even things like an ELO rating system to see kind of which models are better. And all of this works really well. It's a very effective way to be able to work with people is to simply just ask them if they what they like better or not. And this is something that I saw you know, rise with the LMs, this approach for getting feedback. But I think it's going to stick. And I think it's something that for folks inside an enterprise that are going to have long lasting and working on lots of projects, like setting up things like this, where you can gamify this, give people an incentive to spend 10 or 15 minutes over lunchtime, taking a look and kind of looking at a few responses and is a, a way to kind of get that continual data on a regular basis for all of your projects like that. So this is why I kind of highlight this. I put a couple of examples here um, in the slides of code examples where you can go do it. But I think it's worthy of consideration kind of if you're working in these approaches. Now let's move to model-based approaches, which I think is the most interesting and really the area that's moving so fast. It's literally over the last three weeks I've given this presentation, I've had to continually update it in this, in this section like this. And I expect what I'm talking from now and how I present it, it'll be radically different uh, three months from now. So let's go with this, but just know that this is the quickest moving and kind of will go out of date the quickest. So a lot of times when we're thinking about evaluating, we evaluate against a reference or ground truth, something that's known. And so sometimes for like hallucinations, people want to see, you know, let's evaluate models against some known facts. And we might have like a gold standard data set to do that. There's benchmarks for this. But all of these are really limited because we're limited to that set of facts that we already have as the ground truth like that. This is where model-based evaluation comes in is because what we're going to do is instead of having a human evaluate the output and rate it, we're going to have a model evaluate it and rate it. Now, let me give you a kind of a quick example of this to kind of get your head around this. So take a look at this, parse it through. I'm going to wa walk through with you. What we're going to do is we're going to create a metric called professionalism. We're going to define it to the large language model. This is what we mean by professionalism. And then we're going to provide a grading scale. And this one here, you can see a grading scale of one to five to do that. And then we identify which model is going to do that. So now that we've set up, you know, how we wanted to evaluate it. Now what we do is we send an input into GPT-4 with this prompt, and then we can get an output back from the model that gives us a score and the justification for why it graded it like this. And this is how we use a model for evaluation. Now, this model evaluation, you can see there's some very easy cases to use it. I call it almost like as assertions where things that take very little judgment, almost like if then statements of classic assertions like that. So things like language match, you know, is it English? Is it Spanish? What's the sentiment of it? Was this toxic or not? What's the length of this? Like th these are for the most part, you could think of as easy to determine things that models could very simply do this. You can see again that where this ties into that functional correctness where we talked, but we can have models instead of a human evaluating this, we can have models evaluate these, these, these elements as well. And one of the most common things we ask models to do is evaluate um, based on, you know, is this factual? Is this relevance? So this is an example from Ragas, which 
is an example that I have in, in the GitHub as well that measures kind of the performance of a response against these two factors. Now, there's more sophisticated ways to do this. So this is a, a more recent framework, kind of G of Valve, which has a much more complicated prompt to do this, where it's gonna kind of evaluate it and generate it. But at the end of the day, what it's still doing is looking at that context to help us evaluate it. Other approaches kind of use a sampling approach where this is this one again is on hallucinations. And so what they do is ask the model many, many, many times. And then based on that, they see if it's consistent or not. And that helps us understand whether or not it's hallucinating. So what you see here is different styles of prompts to be able to use and evaluate these models. And we're gonna see a variety of this stuff as we go through this. Um, one of the questions people ask me is like, what model I should use? I see GPT-4 used the most because it's the strongest eval. If you have something that's really takes a lot of reasoning ability, makes sense to use GPT-4. If on the other hand, you can get away with something like three and a half for production use, especially it's a lot cheaper to run if you have to run it against a large scale. Recently now, we've seen papers like Judge LM come out showing you how you can even train your own models for evaluation um, as well. And I expect this will continue to kind of get there um, as well. So now you can see it's, it, we're getting so much more complicated where um, we're gonna evaluate a large language model, but we're also gonna train another model to help ev us evaluate it. And yes, it feels like kind of turtles on turtles where we're doing this evaluation, but let's dig into, is this okay to use? So far, you know, the early results we've seen is using these models, using these models is very, very kind of correlated, very similar to what humans are doing when they judge it. So here you can see there's a strong correlation in this case um, between how the humans and um, the GPT model graded it. Um, here's another one where you can see they measured this on, I think it was on a five point scale where almost everything was within one point between when the human graded it versus whether GPT-4. So again, very close alignment between them. In this one, again, you'll see close alignment or do you? If you look carefully, you'll see that there's actually one that's not a little bit aligned. And this actually gets us to um, one of the biases that people have noticed with these models. And there's a couple of different biases. And I should point out these biases also, some of these also exist with other forms of evaluation, like human evaluation, where humans as well as machines like to favor the response in the first position. Or LMs like longer, wordier responses. Um, we talked about that with that Al Alpaca e-valve. Here's the last one that I wanted to point out. LMs have a slight bias towards their own answer. They like themselves. They think they produce good output and they judge that with a higher win rate like that. Now, there's ways to mitigate these biases like swapping the different order, right? Making sure um, the responses are similar in length, right? Don't use the same value, don't use the same LM that you're outputting as for evaluation. This is where like, you know, use GPT-4 for evaluation, but use another model for what you're training is, is one. Here's a little bit of a hint using a lower precision grading scale works much better. So I've been asked like, hey, should I use between zero to 100? The LMs aren't as good as kind of giving you that answer between zero and 100, like between, you know, is it a 72, is it a 78, is it a 92? Instead, narrow that down. Often I see people doing a simple binary, zero, one, if that's my recommendation, if you can get away with it, or you can do a simple or a grading scale like one, two, three, um, like that. So lots of different types of model-based evaluation. Expect all of this to quickly change. So know that if you're seeing this in two or three months from now, the, the landscape is moving on types of this, but we're gonna see a lot of uses of evaluation here um, as well. Because the thing is, is it's so much cheaper and faster than human evaluation. And the quality of this evaluation seems to be pretty good. Um, we don't have to spend the time collecting all that ground truth data to be able to do, do this um, as well. Now, there is sensitivity to instructions and prompts. We, we talked about some of the biases kind of with using this model-based evaluation as well. Um, in the repo, I know I've got a couple of examples there. One of them is using Ragas, um, which was one of the earliest frameworks I saw for model-based evaluation 
where you can simply just set it up with a little bit of code telling it which of the metrics you want out of the library. You then apply those metrics to your data set and you get a score for each one of these metrics on your results like that. Very easy to use. Um, I also added the Databricks, which I really like that, how they've approached it in MLflow um, as well. Oh, I do have a slide on that. Um, so here's kind of what it looks like. I think I showed you this earlier. Like, let's first create the metric in MLflow. And then what we can do is we can simply apply it and evaluate any data um, that we want. Um, MLflow also has tools for kind of helping you evaluate the results of this as well. So I think it's, it's going to be a great starting point for people thinking about model-based evaluation. Now, all this model-based evaluation comes down to prompts. You're using prompts to help describe exactly the task you want the model to do. So I've also tried to, in the GitHub, give you lots of examples of prompts for common tasks. So recently, um, ByDance, the TikTok folks, released a paper called Salmon, where they had kind of a, it was like an audio text QA model. They had a lot of prompts that they used because they use model-based evaluation. So I've, and, I, and in the GitHub, I have text versions of all of these. So I cut and pasted that in there to give you some examples of real prompts that people have used for this. Um, besides that, I have examples for data quality. One of the things that we've seen is people have used these prompts, model-based evaluation, to improve data quality. Identify right where the data issues are, where the, where the data is good. The factuality relevance is very, very, very relevant, but very often used in the rag type use cases where you're worried about hallucination. Um, uh, getting a grading scale is something else um, that often comes into play as well. So this was this was a slide, again, from the Databricks post. I've got a bunch of their slides um, here where they just talked about how they used model-based evaluation for improving data quality um, like that. So not even kind of the main LLM task, but some other tasks like that. And I think we're going to see a lot of model-based evaluation everywhere um, like that. Everybody's working on this. Like I put a couple of packages in there, but let me tell you, like so many vendors are out there kind of building model-based evaluation into everything like that. So expect to see it all over the place um, as well. The last approach I want to talk about is red teaming. That's way over on the right. As you'll see, it's the most expensive, but it's the most flexible. Now, again, a Part of, part of this talk is giving you a little bit of history. Um, that's what I like to do. Back in, I think it was 2016. So this is, uh, the world was a little bit different. I think it was, when it was during like the Republican primaries when Trump was running. The folks over at Microsoft decided to release a chatbot. And they were like, you know what? We built some cool stuff in-house. We want to show the world what we built Let's create a kind of a nice kind of female chatbot, put her out on Twitter, let the world interact. She'll, she's going to learn from all of that um, like that. And they, you know, put out Microsoft Tay. She's like, you know, excited, happy to be out there. Let's chat with everybody. Well, some people weren't so nice to Tay and kind of kept saying mean, nasty things to her. And she learned from that and started repeating this stuff back. And so this was a great lesson in kind of the history of chatbots of when you put these things out, it's important to have guardrails in place. I think one of the reasons OpenAI succeeded so well with ChatGPT is that they're the first chatbot that I'm aware of that was publicly available that didn't fall down like this. I mean, Meta, just a few weeks before, they, before OpenAI had released ChatGPT, had put out um, their Galactica uh, model, which went down in a blaze of fire after a couple of days of kind of attacks and hallucinations like that. But this kind of brings up this idea of kind of the need for red teaming in AI, where what you want to do is you want to test the model against undesirable behaviors. And I think, and I, and I don't think, I know this is going to be important for all of you that are going to put any models into production Red teaming has to be an element of that. And one big reason why is if you take even the best open AI models, even the best llama models, if you spend time fine tuning that model, you've destroyed that RLHF layer that protects against harmlessness, that makes sure it's harmful 
like that. And that's what the recent research has shown. And so what, at this point is what I'm seeing is that, you know, we're going to have to test all of these models out there that get out there because it, there's just so many ways um, like that. Now, there's many ways you can handle, you know, things. One thing you can do, for example, is have a second model assess the outputs of another model that just says, hey, is this model doing everything okay? Is there any risk to this? You know, you can then log and track that is one simple way of using a model-based red teaming. But typically what you want to do is before you get this model and put it into production, you're going to go through a red teaming exercise. I don't have very condensed slides like this. I've kind of linked here to papers like those from Meta that explained, you know, in detail, like how they did this, where they took lots of people with different backgrounds and different risk categories, had them work through lots of different tests like that. And, you know, for Meta, this was real. Like they held back the Llama 233 um, billion parameter model because it didn't pass um, the red test um, prompts. And, you know, they test these things in different languages ac across all of that. The takeaway here is, is you're going to have to think about red teaming. All right, we did it. <laughs> we went through all the different methods um, for going through generative AI. Not done yet, though. What we've done so far is we've largely focused on the technical. Let's take a few minutes to focus on the operational sides of evaluating gener of generative AI. And here what I'm thinking about is if you have this model and you're putting it into production, you need to think about the costs. Now, the, this was a story that was put out by the Wall Street Journal. I have no idea how accurate it was that GitHub Copilot actually costs Microsoft ten or $20 a month to, 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 to run, but they're only getting $10 a month from users. And some users are cost, you know, $80 a month like that. And what this kind of brings to me, and I see this all the time, especially with like self-hosted models like that, where people, you have to do the calculation ahead of time about what the costs are going to be, what the value is going to be, because you can easily get into, and we see this with lots of startups that are making things available for much cheaper than the actual cost like that. Um, so be aware kind of of that. Do that homework up front so that way your model is, is, is valuable. Now, when we get to putting things into production, we have to think about monitoring, right? It's, a, the, again, the sibling of evaluate. There's lots of traditional ways we have for, mo for monitoring models. So let's start with all that stuff. Yes, we're going to have to adapt them a little bit to kind of GPUs, look at GPU utilization or <clears throat> response time and error rates. But what I want you to do is be aware that there's some things that we know are different, like you have to think, take into account prompt drift, for example. But there's other things we're going to learn along the way. So there was a great talk recently by one of the folks from ChatGPT talking about how they evaluate, kind of how they monitor their models. And it's not based on GPU utilization. They spent a lot of time studying how people actually use the models, how the data is actually being used inside the GPUs. And what their metric is, is they look at the utilization of the KV cache and the batch. And that for them is a much better way of understanding what the demand is like that. So this is a moving area. I just have a few slides here. It's pretty unstructured, but hopefully um, I just want to get in your head that you should be thinking about monitoring these models. There's many ways to monitor. I don't think there's one way that fits all of these different pieces, but take this into consideration. The better you do a job of monitoring, the better you're going to be able to catch issues and solve them quickly. Otherwise, right, everybody will have to build monitoring at some point. It's just you'd rather do it ahead of time before everything breaks as well. There's lots of things we can monitor for that responsible AI to kind of looking at performance as well as thinking about the entire kind of user workflow as we go through this. Now that we've spent some time going through the different metrics, let me just apply them to one type of use case that's very common just to get a sense of how these different types of evaluation kind of approaches kind of interconnect and how they come. So I'm going to use RAG. Hopefully most of you are familiar with it. It's a very kind of common approach nowadays where we're cl combining classic information retrieval with LLMs um, as a way um, to do kind of question answer with that. Um, when we're using these, um, 
I'm not, I'm not going to explain rag. So let me start by giving you, here's the recipe for evaluating rag. What you want to do is you want to use a model-based approach for evaluation on, on, on factuity. You want to focus on precision and you want a factuity about 95%. Everyone with me? No, 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 no. Hopefully your radar went off and like, hey, why is Raj talking like this? This is exactly what I don't want you to talk about. What I want you to point out is, again, we need to think about evaluating this in the big picture before we start jumping into um, pieces like this. Like we need to think about what are the business metrics for RAG? And I see very little discussion of them. You know, RAG, again, we're answering questions. What's the value of getting a question correctly? What's the value of, what are the consequences if we miss them? We should be able to put together a workflow like this to understand what the value to the organization would be of having a potential RAG model before we, yes, you can build it in LangChain in 15 minutes, but before we move it to production, before we put a lot of resources, we need to kind of vet this out in this way. Similarly, for operation metrics, there's lots of different things we need to think about, like, you know, how much data are we going to label? How long is this going to take? What's the cost of running these models? Should I do that? Should I be, you know, using kind of a commercial API? How much of this data is changing over time? You know, how, what's the going to, is my IT internally ready to have this project move to production? Are they able to hit I've seen many data scientists build things in the cloud, but their IT is based on prem and there's no way that they're going to be able to move that into production. So just before you kind of do some type of science experiment that has no value, make sure you kind of vet these things out um, like this. This is just a few of handful of the questions um, you want to think. Okay, so let's now jump into kind of the technical part of evaluating a RAG use case. Now, the current approach, and this is where I've been motivated, I see people building these systems all the time, and they just literally stick their finger up. They eyeball a few examples, and that's all they're doing for evaluation. It's really so poor to do, partly because people don't have the tools and they haven't been given ways to evaluate these models. And that's where, let's attack some of that today. Now, you might want to think about the LLM evaluation of, of RAG as the entire system where when somebody asks a question, you know, was the final answer factual? Did it include the proper references? Was it easy to understand what was the query time? Like one piece is you might think about asking those questions and putting quantitative metrics around that. That's one way. But I want you to think deeper. Whenever we have these complicated systems, I think there's value in decomposing them. Look at the different parts of the system. And here we have a retrieval part we have a part where it's doing that augmented generation. And let's evaluate each of those pieces of the pipeline separately because this way, if we evaluate different pieces together, we can find out which piece is causing the problem. A common thing we have with when we're working with, with RAG use cases is the problem is on the retriever. So many people have poor retrievers and then they think they need a newer LLM and that's what's causing it. But really it's, the, it's they're not retrieving the right documents. <clears throat> and when we look at retrieval, we start breaking this down that way. We start asking, you know, we need retrieval. Is you know, is this low precision? Are all the chunks in the retrieve set relevant, right? Are the relevant chunks being retrieved? Were they in the proper order? Were they outdated? Was there latency? Those are all things that we can put numerical metrics around. Augmentation. How can we ensure the answers were factually correct? Understandable, right? Is there any toxicity bias issues? Measure latency. Again, we're separating the problem into two parts and analyzing it like that. And once we do that, for example, for retrieval, we have ways of measuring retrieval. Now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit of work. Like you have to go out and collect a data set where you have inputs of queries, where you know what the ground truth is for what documents should be retrieved. And then what you can do is once you know what should be retrieved, we can do, right, go back to this list here, we can use this exact matching approach to see was the exact documents that we expected pulled out of this or not, and use things like a success rate or hit rate for doing this. Jerry Liu over from Llama Index has spent a lot of time talking about the best ways to evaluate and optimize. He came out with this post a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not here to give you the recipe on optimizing your rag. He's got a better recipe, but I want you to just see how all this evaluation connects 
into that. Similarly, if we talk, look at augmentation, right? we can again evaluate augmentation by understanding a, the context, what the generated response is, but what the ground truth is, what it should be, right? Like what the, what the truth is. And we can go look at our different methods that we have for evaluation. And here, there's a couple of different things we can use from human evaluation to model-based approaches. We can set up an arena and then use all these different types of approaches to help us evaluate, you know, was that, you know, faithful? Was that response relevant like that? And so hopefully this gives you a better sense of like how we can bring all these things together to be able to do, do this. So, so that was a pro trip there. The last piece I want to mention is I didn't spend a lot of time here, but one of the things that people have been doing, for example, for building out these RAG data sets that we're going to use for evaluation is generating synthetic evaluation um, data sets. LMs are very good at this. It's almost worth like a separate video on how to do this. I've put a couple examples here for in the in the um, in the case of RAG, how we can do how we can do this. But this is another important piece of when we're talking about evaluating models is nowadays we're starting to see more and more of using LMs to help generate those data sets for that. So we're not just dependent on humans to do that. So bunch of notebooks out there. I'm continually adding more to the GitHub. So keep an eye out there. One other talk that is a lot like this, but just slightly different vibe, but I like it because it's a practical focus, is Josh Tobin has a good talk on evaluating LLMs um, as well. Otherwise, thank you all. I'm recording this in early November of 2023. I expect I will do updates because this is a fast moving field. Let me know what things changed, what you like, but I appreciate all of you bearing with me for the last hour and a half.